god, this is so good! Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. One of the main players in the latest Netflix documentary called Murder Among the Mormons is a key player called Brent Ashworth. I don't think his story has really been told very well, and I'm excited to have him on our podcast here at Gospel Tangents. So we're going to talk about the crazy world of Mormon collecting and uh, talk about some of the deals that uh, fell through between Brent and uh, Mark Hoffman. And so it's going to be a fun conversation. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff that didn't make it into the documentary. And we'll have some, even some forged checks, um, or bounce checks, I should say, that uh, Mark gave Brent and uh, a lot of other memorabilia. It's going to be a fun conversation. We're going to do this right in uh, Brent's bookstore. So it's going to be a fun conversation. You won't want to miss it. Check it out. All right. Well, welcome to Gospel Tangents. I'm excited to have uh, one of the uh, principal players in the Hoffman saga. We're capitalizing on the uh, recent documentary on Netflix. And so could you go ahead and tell us who you are and where we are? I'm Brent Ashworth, and uh, this is my uh, little store called B. Ashworth in uh, Provo Town Square, downtown Provo, Utah. Uh, and we're on Gospel Tangents. Yes, it's great. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you know, I've talked to several of the principal players, and uh, you were probably one of the most deeply involved mm -hmm. in the whole uh, Mark Hoffman saga here. I, I noticed here in your bookstore... You've got a picture of General Joseph Smith behind you. We've got Don Larson who pitched the perfect game in the World Series, right? That's right. You Honus bet. Wagner. Yeah. Um, Walt Disney. There's quite a few. Walt Disney. Abraham Lincoln, George Washington. So you yeah. are a collector of mm -hmm. everything. That's right. My kids <laughs> say I collect dust, and that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and the, the numbers that are just being thrown around here, um, how do you get involved in collecting? Well, I blame my grandmother for my collection, even though I don't remember her. She died when I was a year old. Uh -huh. But uh, there was a box of her things that got saved from a family fire, uh, which I watched when I was seven. And uh, I asked my mother if uh, there was anything left. And we went out and found the box. And in the box were 12 letters of Heber J. Grant written to my grandmother back in 1931 to 33. And, uh, and President Grant's uh, motto signed by him, that which we persist in doing becomes easy to do. Not that the nature of the thing has changed, but that our power to do has increased. And I've got that over on my, on the the Grant desk. That's Heber J. Grant's desk from his home. Oh, there. you're kidding. Yeah. Well, and I should tell everybody, I don't know if you can see this chair that I'm sitting in. This is Brigham Young's chair. It's a rocking chair, it's yeah, a... from his home in St. George, uh, made by a man who fought in the Indian Wars here. Yeah, for yeah. Him. So I, I'm I'm honored to be sitting here in Brigham Young's chair. <laughs> it's good so to have you. Pretty cool. Yeah. So, so yeah. So you so you found this box with some Heber J. Grant letters and yeah, and that got me curious. You know, every collector kind of starts with a set in mind, and I'm reading all these personal letters to my grandmother who was trying to figure out with my grandfather whether to leave their oldest son on a mission to Texas during the Great Depression because they suddenly couldn't afford 25 bucks a month to send him. My grandfather thought, uh, matter of pride, the boy ought to come home. Grandmother starts writing the president of the church. She was a convert of the church and a Relief Society president. And uh, she wanted to know what he had to say. And he uh, wrote these letters back, and uh, some were two and three pages long, quoting scripture and saying, leave your son out there even without purser script, like the earlier missionaries. I asked my uncle before he died in 1987. He'd served uh, 11 years as a bishop in Las Vegas, and I said, uh, Uncle Bo, I said, uh, were you ever without money from the family? And he says, yeah, there's about three months there. They couldn't send me anything. I said, what was that like? He says, oh, we lived off the fat of the land. It was great. You know, everybody in Texas helped these poor starving missionaries from Idaho and Utah. And uh, so uh, President Grant, I learned more about him from these letters than anything I'd ever learned in junior Sunday school. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could collect something personal of each president of the church? And that went, uh, doing that about 15 times over the years. I, I've gone to uh, U.S. presidents and uh, kings and queens of different countries. Uh, I did uh, a lot of uh, famous women and, and uh, a lot of uh, people of color and others throughout history. We've got the last known letter of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. in our collection. 
uh, written from the motel right before he was shot, thanking a group in Kansas for letting their uh, their pastor uh, march in the sanitation workers' strike there in Mount Memphis. Uh, and uh, we've got uh, some, some wonderful things of some of our founding fathers and so on. So it's a big collection. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. So uh, I just... Obviously, this requires a lot of money. <laughs> do, do collectors just buy and sell, and you just kind of build up over time? Or? Build up over time. You know, not a lot of money was spent originally. I mean, it was, you know, it was kind of like we traded, well, maybe kids don't do it anymore, but we traded marbles and things when we were kids to get a little better better steely or whatever it was that we wanted. Uh, and that's kind of what collectors do. We, we trade up all the time, usually, try to find something a little more unusual. Uh, something we can brag about, <laughs> whatever it is, uh, or something we can teach history from, which has kind of been my goal. Well, now you call this B. Ashworth's book. So do you do a lot of this book selling here? or, or? I do some. Yes, I do some. Uh, this is more of a museum, this one. <laughs> I did more selling at my earlier stores than this, and I hadn't really planned on opening a third store. This is the third one. I'm an attorney by profession. That's, my, that's what fueled this uh, and my interest in history over the years. But um, I started opening stores about 2006 here in Provo, and I wasn't going to open one when we were called on a mission to uh, Massachusetts um, two years ago. And uh, when we got back, uh, I wanted to bring people to the living room, <laughs> and my wife didn't like that, so I had to find a place, you know, for, for them to come. I don't blame her. And um, uh, like I say, I've been an attorney for many years, and uh, this has been my hobby. I've enjoyed it. Uh, the collection's grown into over a million items now, so it's uh, really huge. And this shop only represents probably 1% or less of the collection. So. Oh, you're kidding. Yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the, I think, one of the largest personal collections in the, in the country. So. Wow. Yeah. So you were a lawyer by trade. Did, uh, so where did you go to law school and get your Well, I went to the University of Utah, and the ironic thing is, is that... Uh, that was there uh, that uh, I took a criminal law class because I was going out to be a prosecutor, which I was down in Price after I left law school. But I took criminal law, and we were sat alphabetically in seats by Professor Lionel Frankel, who was number two at Yale, a real bright guy, and enjoyed his class. He started the class out by saying, this class will be different than any other class you ever take in law school because criminal law does not work. <laughs> And I'm sure that uh, the guy sitting next to me, because we sat alphabetically, uh, and I was Ashworth, and Ted Bundy sat right next to me. No way. Oh, yeah. And uh, he missed a few classes. He was arrested during that semester. Uh, so uh, we, you know, learned more about him as time went on. But I've always blamed Ted for stealing my criminal law textbook, because it's the only one I ever lost. And he didn't want to lose them because they were 50 bucks a piece back in the early 70s. And that was when tuition at the U Law School was 250 So, um, you know, I lost one and I had to buy it again. And I always blamed Ted because I figured he had bigger problems. <laughs> wow. We and then can... I went out into criminal law after that. And so it's ironic I met, met Mark. My goodness. I don't, I don't know many people that have met two notorious serial killers. <laughs> well... Just by happenstance, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> that that might be a whole new episode to yeah. talk about Ted Bundy. We're not here yeah, for that. No, we're that's not. That's amazing. That. Um, wow, wow, that's a big surprise. Well, I didn't know either one of them really. I just, you know, was in proximity quite a bit. Well, a lot more with Mark than I was with Ted. Wow, that's crazy. That is mm -hmm. crazy. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so you, so you, you went to U, Utah for both your undergraduate and your law degree. No, I went to BYU for my undergrad in history and political science, and then uh, I wanted to teach history. It was really one I wanted to do. And Gus Larson and some other professors here tried to help me, but there were really just no positions. And I had a young family, and so it was really a, a choice between law school and ditch digging. And I decided to, <laughs> to make the decision to go to law school. I think that was a wise <laughs> me and decision. my wife. So that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> you know, before we turned the camera on, I said, you know, being a lawyer, especially a prosecutor, mm -hmm. you probably had a lot of people that wanted to kill you, not just Mark Hoffman, right? Well, we had some, we had some people down in, uh, in eastern Utah that made a few threats. Yeah, I remember one, one uh, guy, we arrested his partner one day on drugs, right, driving through the county, Carbon County, um, and uh, uh, when we arrested his partner, uh, he came out of the jail. 
and uh, issued a, a threat to my, my boss and myself. He said, I'm going to blow you guys away. And uh, there was a deputy walking out of that time, and my boss, Ron, Ron Boutwell, said, Did you hear that, officer? He says, Yeah. He says, Well, book him for a terroristic threat. And then he gives me the case. <laughs> oh, you're <laughs> and, kidding. <laughs> so I had to. I had to get it uh, settled quickly and get them out of the county as soon as I could. So that's where it ended up. Wow. That, I mean, is it pretty unnerving to get, to get these kind of threats? Well, it was interesting. I was the young prosecutor at the time, and I was the gopher. So uh, uh, back then, Utah had a law, and any unattended death, uh, they'd have to send the county attorney out, and he'd send me. Uh, so uh, I get these calls in the middle of the night. Taylor Highway Patrol, we got a DOA down in a bar. And I'd have to go down, and, you know, and check it out. I saw so many uh, corpses the first couple of months I was out of law school. I thought, I, I should have gone to med school. <laughs> so it was a different kind of life. But it was a rough and tumble down in Carbon County, Utah at that, that point in time. Wow, you'd think a country, because I think of Price as being kind of a country town. I mean, well, it's still not it very is, big. and it's a very fine town. You've got a lot of wonderful people there. We've still got dear friends there. But you got the mines down there, and uh, you have people that, uh, we had escapees from federal prison. We had others that got jobs in the mines, and they seemed to get drunk and in trouble on weekends, you know. And uh, sometimes there were fighting, sometimes there were drugs. Same trouble you have everywhere. Uh, I don't think Price was any worse than other areas. It's just that, and there are a lot of good people there, a lot of dear friends there. But uh, I was just at the center of it. <laughs> so uh, I remember the juvenile judge saying this one time, Paul Keller, and he was LDS, saying at the time, if we got rid of three families down here, we'd get through, rid of 95% of his problem kids. And that could very well be true. Wow, that's mm -hmm. crazy. That's crazy. Boy, we, <laughs> I could, I could tell we could go a lot of different directions. Yeah. But we're gonna, we're right. gonna try to focus on Mark Hoffman here. You bet. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so how did you, how did you first become acquainted with Mark? Well, I'd heard about him. I've actually been, I was actually a pretty well known collector around Utah for about twenty years. Had a lot of, lot of local publicity and things like that. Uh, over things that we found, whether it was letters of Joseph Smith Brigham Young or not necessarily letters, but other things that, that, that uh, George Washington and Abraham Lincoln, I was collecting founding fathers early on too. So I had quite a bit of notoriety as a collector before I met him, and then I heard about the Anthon transcript. And, uh, and I got uh, Mark's uh, phone number from, uh, from a friend, uh, Steve Barnett, that was working at Cosmic Airplane Books. And, um, and I called Mark up. And, uh, and I, I took notes down. In fact, I, I found my notes. Oh, you're kidding. I found my notes when I was cleaning out my drawer in the 90s. So it tells you how often I used to clean out my desk. But um, uh, I made his acquaintance. He said, uh, yeah, I've been meaning to get around to you. But, uh, you know, and, and I said, I, he had heard of me. And I says, well, I'm really anxious to get a letter. I've got documents of Joseph Smith, but I've never had a letter. Oh, I just happen to have one. Okay. So this is how we first met. and uh, What year is this approximately? Well, this is exactly, it was uh, May of 81. So he just made uh, history with his second big find, the Joseph Smith III blessing, when I met him the month after that. And it heard about all that. So, um, so the, rate, the, first, the first major discovery was the Anthem transcript. Anthem transcript. And then the second was one. was in 1980. And I'd heard about that. And, um, and then in 1981, he... Uh, in 1981, he came out with the uh, Joseph Smith the Third blessing, and he got between the two churches, the reorganized Zen Church and our church, on who was going to get it. Long story. Uh, I didn't meet him till just right after that, the month after that, and it was uh, May of '81. And uh, our phone conversation, I took down notes. I found found my notes, uh, and he says, oh, "I just happened to have a letter of Joseph Smith written to his wife Emma." And it's dated March 6, 1833. Dear wife, Brother Williams uh, has this day received word from Brother Morley that we should uh, commit the cross plow under the hands of the poor. Uh, you will therefore please to trust it to Brother Williams. By his hand I send this. I subscribe myself, your husband, Joseph Smith, Jr. Uh, so that was $6,000. And uh, I gave him... I gave him, uh, uh, I think it was a Brigham Young document in trade and 4000 in cash for it. And that started us. That was the beginning. Because uh, I, I understand he dealt in authentic documents, too. Well, he got a lot from me. He got some from the church. Uh, there were others, you know, but 
he got quite a few from me over the years, some really remarkable things, including an original. For the Lucy Mack Smith letter, he got an original of the 13th Amendment, ending slavery, uh, you know, signed by all the members of Congress that had voted for it. Uh, that was what the war was fought over. Uh, be a million dollar document today, but back then we figured uh, that, and um, he got uh, the last letter I'd ever seen of George Washington before his death saying if he lived another year, you know, he mentioned that in the letter, and he didn't. He lived another week or two. Um, and uh, he got an important letter of Lincoln. So these are all authentic yeah, documents. Yeah, they were authentic letters. These were, he got a very important letter of Lincoln making Sherman a general uh, during the Civil War. Um, and there was an Andrew Jackson, a John Brown, and some other things. And those all went for the Lucy Mack Smith letter. Uh, which, uh, you know, was the, the biggest of the ones that I got. That and the, the other Martin Harris letter, the faith-promoting uh, letter where Martin Harris reemphasizes his uh, testimony found in the Book of Mormon. Um, that one but was that one was a forgery. Yeah, that, but uh, that was not charged. There's really no test for pencil, even to this day, other than comparing. So the pencil letters of Hoffman were really not charged in, in the case. And that amounted to about a third of what he had uh, were in pencil. Uh, I bought a Lorenzo Snow letter for $5,000 from him that was all in uh, his uh, uh, his uh, pencil. And it was on uh, tithing, on repay, uh, you know, redoing tithing and so on. Um, and uh, so, you know, th none of those were charged because there's really no test for pencil even to this day other than comparison. And that's what he did was, uh, you know, uh, there were no ink tests, no chemical tests for pencil. So uh, none of his pencil things were creations were ever charged. So he could have just used a regular modern pencil for some. Oh yeah, of this? And he did. He did many times. He used uh, um, and uh, so. Doesn't pencil fade over time though? Not generally. I mean, you can get some fading in some colored pencils. They'll change their color and so on depending on the the light hitting them. It's usually the paper that change changes that makes them look different or more difficult to to read over time. I know with my interview with George Throckmorton, one of the things that um, Mark used to do was, and so that I'm curious about these these pencil things because I hadn't heard about those. But Mark used to draw lines to make it look like it was lined paper. Mm -hmm. And George had a very good ruler, and he said, hey, this is off by a fraction yeah. <laughs> of an inch or whatever. Oh, George's um, the best. Yeah, that's great. So, we're, I mean, that was one, and I don't know if these were uh, pencil or ink mm -hmm. documents, but are, are, are you familiar with that? Or were they well, I am, because George made me familiar with it. We've become good friends over the years, and uh, we still meet occasionally. Um, and uh, with uh, our friend Steve Mayfield, who's made it a... A job to collect things too on on Hoffman. So, we we uh, the pandemic slowed us down, but we try to get together for lunch about every other month. Oh wow! But uh, we still do that. Any rate, um, yeah, uh, George has made me aware of that. And in, in the year uh, 2005, for the 20th anniversary of the Hoffman bombings, the Question Document Examiners of America met in Salt Lake for their 20th anniversary. They did that. <laughs> because it was the 20th anniversary of Hoffman, and uh, of course one of their members, George uh, Schrockmorton, had really broken the case, along with John Flynn, or um, Flynn Bill from, Flynn, Bill Flynn, Flynn from uh, Arizona, who I don't know, but but Throckmorton I know well. Any rate, uh, uh, they asked me to be the keynote speaker at that convention <laughs> because they <laughs> needed a dumb guy that had been taken by Hoffman uh, to to lead out, and I said, look, I'm happy to do that, and you can only say you were dumb so many times. But I said, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, I'm happy to do it if you're willing to go to lunch with me and answer some of my current collecting questions. There you go. And they said they would. And so when it was lunchtime, I had all the bosses there and George was there. And I said, are there, first question asked, are there any, are there any chemical tests for pencil yet? And they all answered no. This was 20 years after. Right. Now maybe something's changed the last uh, 16 years. I don't know. But there were no tests for pencil. They just compare, you know, uh, like Dean Jesse used to do with the, right. with the handwritten stuff, Joseph. And um, Dean's a dear friend, by the way. At any rate, so uh, there no tests for pencil, so the prosecutor never, the prosecution never brought any cases against his pencils, which were some of his, some of his best stuff. What's <laughs> done in pencil? Good forger will write in pencil. You got to be really careful about pencil, because uh, mm -hmm. unless you're really keen to uh, examining things very close by comparative, 
uh, you know, there, there's no no tests as such for a pencil. So, but ink that's different. So we they couldn't a, charge him with any pencil forgeries. Not really. It would have been really difficult to do it. I mean, so now if uh, if somebody had a pencil forgery, would and they they could prove that it went through. Hoffman, would, would you just assume it was likely a forgery? Well, I would. You know, I would. For instance, uh, um, about anything that went through Hoffman's hands, I would assume. Um, and, uh, yeah, that would be that would be something that I'd, I'd worry about. There's a bunch of Hoffman things I've stayed away from just because we don't know. For instance, he started uh, one of the first things when I was helping the police on those days I went up after, uh, after the bombing. I, I think I may have mentioned that I got a call uh, when our family had taken off because we were um, told by uh, uh, four people when they announced Hoffman had been blown up uh, to get out of town. Three were attorney friends, two in the key bank tower, Brent Christensen and Steve Woodland. And then uh, Rich Hill from Provo uh, was heard that on the radio and he called me. And, uh, and I appreciate that. But none of those calls got us moving. It wasn't until I heard from Jay Todd at the church, the Ensign editor, who called me up and said, uh, the brethren wanted me to call you and tell you to get your family out of town. That's the call that got us moving. And we went down to St. George for a couple of days. And um, it was while we were down at the Coral Reef Inn on the, on the main drag there, the boulevard, that a lady comes to the swing pool. We got a bunch of kids in there at the pool. And, and um, she said, is there somebody named Brent Ashworth here? And I says, yeah, that's me. So there was a guy on the phone that says he's uh, the chief of police in Salt Lake, wants to talk to you. And I thought, oh, brother. And so I got on the phone. So this is Bud Willoughby, chief of police. And because I dealt with the police a lot, it wasn't a matter of uh, much of lack of respect. But I, I knew they had the wrong guy. And I just said, uh, why don't you get out there and find the real guy? I want to get my, my family back home. This is ridiculous. So, you know? they, so they told you it was Mark Hoffman was the bomb. Well, he said that's our prime suspect. And uh, what he said, what he said over the phone was after, after he let me spew forth for a minute or two, he was very professional. Bud Willoughby was very professional, and he says, "Mr. Ashworth, I just have two questions for you." So I got my attention. He says, "The first is, is how come you didn't meet with Mark uh, Wednesday afternoon at two fifteen like he'd done the previous four years?" And I had to think for a minute, and I says, "Well, uh, my wife talked me out of it." I said I was going to meet with him, and in fact, he'd called the day before, the day the two people were killed, the bombs. He couldn't get me. When he called our home, he got my wife. And uh, Mark said to uh, my wife, and, and they, he'd been in our home the night before, he said, uh, uh, is Brent there? And she said, no, he's headed to work. I was working in Spanish Forks. It was about a 15-minute, 20-minute drive. He says, well, do you remember Steve Christensen? This is Hoffman. And she says, well, yeah, the guy that finally bought the salamander letter, it was offered to me and President Hinckley at a higher price, 50000 apiece. And uh, Steve had bought it for forty. She says, yeah, the guy that, that bought the, uh, the salamander letter, yeah, well, he's just been murdered. That was the word Hoffman used with my wife. So we had to pass that along to the prosecutor. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Brent Ashworth. In our next conversation, we'll talk about what he first thought when police told him that Mark was the suspect. But then one day, uh, I'm still thinking, you got the wrong guy here. And uh, yeah, Mark's a liar and a cheat, but he, you know, he never murdered anybody. He didn't have the guts for that. I, he was a wimp. I couldn't see, you know, uh, in the police report, they called him Mr. Milk Toast. I mean, that's the way he came across with everybody, especially back east when he went back east. There's this hayseed from Utah, you know. So I just couldn't figure that in my mind. I'd been involved with a lot of crime things down in Price, and just I couldn't figure he would be, you know, the one to kill people. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to hear the entire interview uncut, sign up at patreon.com slash gospel tangents and for five dollars a month you can hear the entire interview without any interruptions if you'd like to see the whole video that's just eight dollars a month and you can sign up either at youtube.com slash gospel tangents or on our website at gospeltangents.com and click the yellow subscribe button or you can go to patreon.com slash gospel tangents and I'll just need to make sure that we're Facebook friends and I'll add you to our insiders group and you can see the entire interview uncut. If you'd like to get PDF transcripts of our interviews, those are just $10 a month 
and for just $15 a month I will send you paperback versions of our transcripts um, as soon as they come out or of course you can uh, buy them on Amazon as well uh, go to amazon.com and do a search for gospel tangents interview and uh, you can see all of our transcripts there don't forget to sign up for our updates at facebook.com slash gospel tangents of course you can follow us at gospel tangents on Twitter to hear our interviews updated to your podcast player go to tinyurl.com slash gospel tangents and make sure you give us a five-star review and of course you should show your support for gospel tangents with one of these cool t-shirts like this green one or light blue sport gray royal blue purple of course black beautiful gold and of course utah red i probably left out some colors but if you want to see more go to gospeltangents.com shop and you can uh, get one of these so once again thanks for listening click here to subscribe here for a transcript and over here we've got some more of our great videos thanks again